Skill Alexander is Kelly Bidlin live from Bar Canada at the D in downtown Las Vegas. Sneaky spectacular show today. How you doing, man? Sneaky spectacular. Yeah. Let's go. They're spectacular, yeah. and then there's the spectacular that sneaks <laughs> up on you. And you're like, whoa, that was spectacular. That's what we got today. <laughs> You good? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Uh, uh, here's what happens today on the show. We will talk with uh, we'll talk baseball with Mark Borchard. Um I try to hesitate to sort of update my March April Cleveland Guardians bet because not everybody's on it, so not everybody's going to be that interested in it. But there's a bunch of folks who are, so we'll update that. We'll talk baseball with Mark Borchard. Uh Paul Carr on the Champions League, the first leg of the quarters. First leg of the quarterfinals of the Champions League. We'll get into it with Paul Carr, who's been pretty scorching hot lately, as I recall. I, don't, I think he's still in a, he, on a heater. Um, and we'll talk about the draw and how it really worked out pretty uh, pretty interestingly. We'll get into that with uh, Paul. And then, of course, Masters full steam begins today. John Hasselbauer from uh, the Lines uh, at PGA Tout. He says that ironically on Twitter. Uh, we'll talk uh, Masters with him. And then what has become a tradition here on a numbers game is once the college basketball formula clears, and by the way, uh, we'll get into UConn here momentarily. UConn, of course, flourishing through the formula. You didn't need a formula for UConn this year, but the formula uh, cashes again. We have this tradition where we then segue into Dave Tyndall's master's formula for a day. Um, not quite as tried and true but he's hit the runner-up the last two years, just to give you an example. But he has a master's formula. He goes through the last 10 winners at Augusta. Uh, it's based on, Kelly, ready for this? Age, world ranking, appearances, best finish, um, recent form, winning form, recent major form, last year's finish, whole bunch of stuff. Yep. We'll get into that with him. Always a, always a good uh, And it uh, produces a name. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I love what – I think everybody who follows golf follow, looks at what Dave puts out every year yep. for the Masters and how this works out. And I, and I think for, especially for those people just getting into golf betting, it's always an interesting way of – how do you kind of whittle down the field at the Masters? Because a lot of that is what we're all doing just in different ways. That's right. So we'll talk to Dave uh, by the end of the show as well. Uh, we must begin with UConn. And we must begin. Congratulations to everybody who had a future on UConn. I only had them to get to the Final Four. I didn't have a future on them. But to, to those who did, mazel tov to you. Um, where do you where do you begin? First back-to-back -back NCAA champs since the Florida Gators 2006-2007. Before that, it was Duke back in the early 90s. Um, over the past two NCAA tournaments, UConn 12-0 straight up, 12-0 against the spread. And we're talking big spreads. I mean, this team was just unbelievable. Uh, first team in tourney history to win consecutive titles and cover in every game. Point differential last year in the tournament, remember six games, was plus 120. This year was plus 140. That's plus 260, Kelly. I've done the addition. <laughs> Uh, it's insane. For UConn as a school, it's their sixth title in the last 26 years. Six titles. Only UCLA and Kentucky, the bluest of blue bloods, have more. 11 for UCLA and eight for Kentucky. UConn has six. Little UConn. Um, and what can you say about this game yesterday other than Danny Hurley is the best coach in college basketball? If you didn't know it yet, I hope you know it now. Um UConn wins by 15, 75 to 60. They covered the seven-point spread. Listen, Zach Eady was great in defeat. I thought he was – I thought in the first half, I was like, oh, boy, this is going to be fascinating. Yeah. Like, this guy's on top of – but then he kind of – he just gassed. Mm -hmm. It felt like he gassed. I don't know if it was because of the pace in this game or just cumulatively, but 37 points in defeat. He did not get most outstanding players. So to the question of, hey, can a guy on a losing team still be – you know, still win most outstanding player? And I mentioned it hadn't happened since 1983 in Akeem Olajuwon with Houston when NC State won the title, beat them in the finals. The answer is probably no. It can't. Yeah, I, I'm sure it. I'm, I'm guessing it still wouldn't have happened. But I all I did think about, like at the end of that game, was those like what was it? The first five minutes of the second half where he did feel it felt like he was out of sync. He was missing stuff. I, like he had a massive game with the potential to be a way bigger game. Like he could have put up 45 easily in this. I mean, they Purdue scored 60 points. He scored 37 of them. <laughs> And, and UConn, as we talked about, the, you couldn't have had a, a, a better juxtaposition of dominant player on, on losing team versus democratically great yes. on the other side, right? And Tristan Newton ends up with most outstanding player for the Final Four, uh, not Donovan Klingon. So uh, congratulations to those who had Tristan Newton. 
And so, you know, what it, Danny Hurley basically, and he said this after the game, but you could tell it was happening during the game, which is, Zach Eady, we're going to let Zach Eady beat us. You get 25 shots, great. But each one of those is going to be a two. You're not going to beat us, even if you make all of them. You're not going to beat us shooting twos. We're going to prevent everybody else. I'm talking about Braden Smith and Lawyer and Gillis and Jones. We're going to we're going to make sure that those guys don't beat us cuz athletically he knew they're so much better than those guys. Uh, and if Edie somehow outplays Klingon by some no big deal. Mm -hmm. To that effect, Purdue not only made one three-pointer, one a breadstick as we call it in tennis. One three-pointer. Forget that. They only got 7 off. And that's the only stat you need to know from this game. Seven offensive rebounds, obviously, were huge, too, for UConn, much like it was for South Carolina on the women's side. But but seven three-pointers attempted. You're never beating UConn uh, with that in your stat line. And so congratulations again to all. And I would just want to say this. For me, obviously, Danny, Danny Hurley, like if, he, uh, he's, if you don't get that he's the best coach in college basketball, for me, it's one and Nate Oates is two. And it's also why, like, I refuse to talk about John Calipari for more than three or four minutes yesterday because he's a junior high school coach compared to these guys. Great recruiter, but he's just a junior high school coach. Seriously, when you when you look at the mastery of, of guys like Hurley and Nate Oates for Alabama. Um, how about, beyond how that, about Hurley? Up? How about Hurley helping out his helping out his guard on the court? For oh, that? <laughs> by the way, why was so wasn't bizarre. why wasn't that a tech? I have no idea. You can't touch your player on the no court. I have no idea. I was thinking the same thing. How is that not a technical foul? Hurley's a spaz. Don't get me wrong. He's also a world class spaz. I, that was, I was like, he's out of his mind. I was like, yeah. he's, he, they are cru they are cruising to a blowout, and the guy's losing his mind on the <laughs> sideline. <laughs> every and by the way, every time there's a block, uh, every time there's a charge called on his team, he always says the guy's flopping. Right? right they yeah. put it, they put it in slow motion. He's like flopper. That was um, so bizarre. That was so bizarre. I mean, the ref is right there. He had to like almost go around the ref to like push his guard. I was like, Wait, what is going on right now? What am I watching? But he, he's amazing. And, and so for me, it was less about, you know, what that game. Obviously, it, it wasn't quite Florida national championship blowout, but it was such a. It was, it was a such, good first half. It was, it was a, a good first, first half. half. Right. Alabama was competitive for a little longer, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good point. Yeah. But. It just kept – all I kept thinking about was where do you put this team historically? And I actually tweeted out yesterday. I said the last – I said since the year 2000 because you can't – you know, when I was a kid, you can't compare, like, just to use the extreme. You can't compare early 80s teams, for instance, to these teams. Early 80s teams, obviously guys stayed three, four years. But, like, Carolina in 82 had Jordan Worthy and Perkins. Uh Georgetown in 84 had Patrick Ewing and Michael Graham. Like, you can't compare these teams to what exists now. Those guys stayed for four years. Right. Jordan, three years in his case. So I said, I just arbitrarily said 2000. Where does this team stand? And they got a bunch of answers from folks. By the way, it doesn't have to be a winner of a championship. Just in terms of – so we had Dr. Bob on yesterday. So I texted Bob yesterday because – while the game was happening – because we kind of grazed on it yesterday when it was on the show, even before the national championship. And I really want to know, because Aaron Schatz, when he's on with us, he's able to say uh, uh, 1991 skins, 2007 Patriots, everybody else is third place or beyond, right? Bob's brain doesn't work that way. So Bob's, you know, Bob is like not interested in that kind of conversation like I am. So he's like, well, Gil, it'd be a huge project. It'd be really tedious to find that out because there's so many college basketball teams. And he's right, right? There's, it's not a set of 32 teams like the NFL is. It's hundreds of college basketball teams. You could narrow it down. Right. You don't have to you know, analyze all 300 plus. But you do have to analyze more than just who wins the tournaments. And so he did confirm. So he, by the way, I said to him, I go, all right, Bob, if it's too tedious for you, like get an intern. He's like, I mean, I have to pay somebody, Gil. I'm like, uh, how about your son? He's six years old. He, you know, so he just doesn't care as much. I was gonna, well, I was gonna say, from like the betting standpoint, it is like, well, why do I care about like figuring out what this year's team versus oh, this year's team because they're never gonna play each other. So, it doesn't matter. He's so <laughs> locked into the day-to-day -day bets that it just doesn't occur to him. Uh, call me crazy, but I still have some historical perspective on this stuff that I find interesting. But he did, uh, he did come to what he alluded to yesterday. In a case you missed it. That the the answer for him off the top of his head, and he's been doing this forever, uh, but since 2000, the quick answer off the top of his head was actually the 
Team Kentucky Wildcats, Ooh. who did not win the NCAA tournament, but you may recall, went to the Final Four undefeated, lost to Wisconsin, and then Wisconsin got beat by Duke. But that Kentucky team... That team was loaded. That right? had the, the Harrison brothers, Andrew and Aaron, Aaron Harrison. Willie Cauley-Stein was also like a huge cog. Uh, but Tyler Hewless, Devin, Devin Booker, Booker Katz, <laughs> they were all on that team. By the way, that might not have been the – if we go through stars, uh, might that not might not have been. been the best Kentucky team it, either. No, it probably wasn't. Because there was a uh, Boogie Cousins, John Wall team in there right. too, right? But that he said that's probably the team. He said, I remember having that team higher rated than almost anything that I've ever done. And he said that's the only comp for this. And honestly, for a two-year run, I think Danny Hurley's right with apologies to both Florida and Duke of the early 90s. I mean, Florida had Al Horford and Yannick Noah. Uh, Yannick Noah, that's his dad. <laughs> you know, Joachim, uh, Joachim Noah. And then Duke, of course, had Leitner, Hurley, his brother, and uh, and Grant Hill for two years. This was, this was basically revamping for UConn. Yeah, really impressive. Congratulations, man. Again, if, uh, if you were smart enough to lock into UConn early and uh, – Who's to say he couldn't revamp and do it again if he sticks around? We'll come back. Drew Dinsick on uh, the NBA. Golf. Tennis. See the Calcutta this year for the Masters? That's next. Numbers Game Visa in the Sports Betting Network. A numbers game on v the sports betting network. Get ready to tee off with a special Masters edition of v Long Shots today at 11 p.m. Eastern. It's Kelly Bidlin's longest day of the year, though he told me yesterday was longer. <laughs> so maybe not. Join v experts Matt Brown, Wes Reynolds, Kelly Bidlin, my man right here, as they break down the field, analyze the best bets, and uncover hidden long shots like the 50-1, to 1, for instance, that uh, Stephen Yeager ticket that Wes cashed on the Houston Open a couple weeks ago, like the 65-1 to 1 on Batia that Matt cashed last week. From the favorites of the Dark Horses, we'll give you the inside scoop on every player and their odds of taking home the green jacket. Whether you're a seasoned golf better or just getting into the game, our expert panel will provide insights and strategies to help you make informed betting decisions. Tune into a special edition of Long Shots today at 11 p.m. to gain a competitive edge and maximize your winnings during this iconic golf tournament. Don't miss out on the exclusive Masters coverage we got at Visa.com slash Masters. Visa, the Sports Betting Network. And by the way, after this show... Uh, I will be recording a special beating, not special, but a regular beating the book Masters preview, the 88th Masters. And I will be joined by two-thirds of the mast of the uh, Long Shots crew. Yeah, you will. Kelly Bidlin and Wes Reynolds, along with Tia's go. That yes. is an acceptable excuse. <laughs> yes, that is an acceptable excuse. That is an acceptable excuse. Uh, this gentleman always participates in a Calcutta when the Masters come around. I'm curious if he's doing it again this year. He's the host, the co-host of not only the Deep Dive podcast, which he does with the very funny Andy Molitor. Uh, Andy Molitor, which is gems of tweets. And uh, he also co-hosts the NBC Sports Bet the Edge podcast with Jay Croucher. Also amusing, but with an accent. It's Drew Dinsick, everybody. How you doing, Drew? Courtesy of the Progressive <laughs> Guest Line. I'm doing great. It's uh, Masters Week. Tough to uh, find anything to complain about. This is uh, I have uh, people hold up uh, day one of the college tournament that Thursday, Friday as sort of their sports uh, kind of clear my entire schedule. I have I'm just going to sit around and watch basketball all day. I, I kind of treat uh, day one and two of the Masters that way. That's maybe more of my my bag. And, and I don't know what it is about this, the setting, uh, just uh, the presentation, the fact that you can watch, you know, specific holes and uh, you can follow specific groups get to know you know players you know games just by watching every shot and hearing them talk to their caddy like you know they, there's just so many things to enjoy about the uh first couple of days of the experience at uh, augusta and so this is a pretty special week yeah and i think it's also just the old man that wants to sit on the couch in all of us right and just just <laughs> sit back there and watch a golf tournament with such a beautiful setting so i i, br I brought up uh the word calcutta and it occurs to me that there's going to be a significant portion of the audience that has no idea what that is can you explain to folks um what that is and if you are participating this year as well yeah well, it sounds like uh we're live uh the uh, the big high stakes one that rufus and jeff do from bet the process is going to go and uh we're going to do that on Wednesday, uh, Calcutta is an auction. So you basically have uh, a bidding system where um, a player is uh, auctioned for fair value across the group. Uh, and then all of the auction, you know, all of the winning bids are put together to comprise the pot. 
Uh, and then the pot is divided up where the winner gets something like 25% and the second place gets 12 and blah, 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 all the way down to usually the top 12 um, all get some cash prize in terms of uh, total finish. It's dead heat rules. Uh, and then there's a, a bunch of booby prize money in there too. So, you know, most bogeys, worst score on a hole, uh, you know, worst round of a player who made the cut gets a, a little bit of a, a, a slice. Um, <laughs> and so basically you come up with fun ways so that even the, you know, the, the truly horrific golfers out there uh, are, you know, are value to bid on. Um, but uh, it's a pretty top heavy, you know, it's a pretty top heavy endeavor. You know, you really, you, you want the winner. Uh, and I think ultimately uh, it's a narrow field this year, <laughs> at least looking at the top of the board. Well, yeah, so that's, a, so that's the first, the first question was, is it just winner take all or is it like one, two, three, but you're saying it's top heavy either way. Um, so, it's top heavy either way. So, the, so the strategies, the general strategies, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And then I'm curious what you're, where, how you're going to approach this, the 88th masters, which is you can spend a lot for the top guys and have, you know, sort of try to get that, or you can do the opposite, I guess, try to pick and, you know, pick off some, some long shots that you, that you think have a shot at winning this and not spend as much. What, what do you think generally is the Drew Dinsick approach this year? Well, so again, it entirely depends on your role in the pool. Like uh, if you are walking in and you know you're the biggest bag, um, go get the big boys <laughs> and get a winner. Uh, if you walk in and you're small stack, uh, then in general, I, you know, you, you're, you're trying to find the Brian Harmons of the world, right? Yeah. The guys who are kind of in that uh, 30 to, you know, 30, 30, um, uh, number 30 ish range who you think can get into the top 10 just based on either form or course fit or whatever uh, course history, you know, you, you have some reason to believe that uh, this guy is ready to pop at this tournament and he's being underpriced. Um, and so, you know, that, that tends to be the way that I play these. I have two or three runners that I think are, uh, are capable of hitting the board and, and go get them. And, uh, ultimately the, um, you know, the, the more you populate a Calcutta pool with players, like, it becomes at some point, um, if you have so much of the pool, then you just end up playing defense and making sure that all of the players that get selected after you've populated your your roster go for above your reserve price so that you're not the one that's ultimately putting liquidity in the pool. Um, and so that gets fun and tricky, and it's funny to watch that when that happens sometimes during the bidding. Um, but uh, ultimately, the um, uh, the more players you have, you're, you're, fight, you're competing against yourself, right? <laughs> like there's a finite number of players who are going to, uh, you know, be, be actually be in contention and in a top-heavy payout like that. Um, you can sometimes, uh, uh, do a little bit of damage if you get too many players. So it's a fun, it's a, it's a fun, uh, way to play the tournament and, uh, everybody is looking for, you know, kind of ways to get involved in betting these days and masters pools, uh, yeah. you know, there, there are, they, they abound, uh, but you know, there's, there ha none have really taken hold, uh, in the way that, you know, the, the NCAA bracket pools have. Uh, and I think a Calcutta pool, if you're exploring that is, is definitely worth, uh, getting involved in. Yeah. NCAA survivors are great. Calcutta's are great, but, but they haven't taken all like brackets, obviously. So Calcutta aside then, um, how are you betting this? Like who do you like that uh, might not be on everybody's radar? I gotta, I, I gotta keep, uh, um, I gotta, I gotta keep all my, uh, my money in pocket for this pool. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so I, right. haven't, I haven't, I haven't made a single, true, it's, made true, a single it's bet just yet. us. Nobody's listening. <laughs> just us. No, no, I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying, I'm not, not even about giving away yeah. secrets. I'm on a team this year where I have like a real deal golf originator with an edge. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this is going to turn out well for me. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, the ultimately the, you know, kind of the macro, um, you know, things that matter this year, you know, that you have a huge, huge influx of new players with the, you know, all of these live guys who, uh, you know, are coming in with data from live that's somewhat questionable. Um, and how exactly you synthesize a price is going to be a little bit challenging, even more than just coming up with a fair median. I think the big question on all the live guys is what do you do with uncertainty? Like how big of a bracket do you put around those guys? And does that make all of them unbettable? It probably is going to for me. Uh, I think the, um, mm. the other kind of interesting question is what do you do with the debutantes, right? It's pretty clearly a course that, um, you know, it, it, it rewards the players who solve certain aspects of it. And that just takes reps. And you have a number of players this year who are uh, at or near the top of the board. Uh, the Lewis, the, the Ludwig Obergs, uh, the, um, uh, the Wyndham Clarks of the world uh, who just, you know, they're, they're expected to do well because they're playing incredibly, incredibly 
uh, competitive golf right now. But, you know, having never experienced the uh, the actual, you know, conditions at Augusta and learning some of the secrets, it's easy to kind of toss those guys, in my opinion. So um, definitely kind of curious who's sticking their neck out with some of these debutantes as opposed to sticking to just generally what works here. Yeah, it's our annual chance to say the name Fuzzy Zeller, the last debutante, exactly. the last uh, first time player to win the Masters back in the late 70s, 1979. Um whether I ask this question, and I'll probably ask it on the podcast too, I think the live thing is fascinating because you do that. that is the real conundrum of this. How do you synthesize that to get a price? But the other one is, you know, whether Thursday's supposed to be rainy and windy, Friday windy a bit, and then the weekend's supposed to be beautiful. Do you wait to see, you know, the, the tea times and, and sort of bet accordingly, or is that a fool's errand? No, this is going to be very important this year. Uh, I want I want uh, Thursday p.m. Friday a.m. players. Um, I think they're going to have something close to a half a shot edge over the uh, the Thursday a.m. Friday p.m. guys. Very simple, Kelly. You see that the same way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still waiting. I guess to look uh, check out the weather a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, Thursday is looking like it's going to be pretty ugly rain wise. Yeah. Um, that was that was definitely the wave that that I thought would have the advantage yesterday. I didn't bet it completely that way, but that definitely were the advantages like right, as of right now. And do you do you earmark golfers, uh, Drew, and you're like, okay, I would bet. I, I like these guys. I would bet them, but pre flop number I don't like. I'm willing to sit back and see if they fall behind and then jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is particularly relevant for ma for majors. Um, I forget the actual number, but uh, the proportion of the pot that comes in live at at the major high liquidity shops is is intense. Massive. It's like yeah. 80 20 80% of the bets are made live what like uh, so you're telling me the pre pre flop numbers only constitute 20% okay, wow okay so there's uh there's going to be players who shorten just because they're out first and guys who haven't teed off yet who you're going to see a better price on just the Thursday afternoon and, and think uh, about you know, that honestly, yeah, yeah think about that that's what the, that's what the the major where you have all winter to bet at pre flop too so that's yeah. should be a a lesson or a guiding you know, a guardrail, guiding post for all of this. Uh, we'll come back. Drew wants to talk some NBA. That's his favorite thing. We'll do that. See if he has tennis bets also. A numbers game on v the sports betting network. For a limited time, we're offering two weeks of our exclusive betting splits for free. Just sign up at v slash splits. The v betting splits page is up. Is updated with DraftKings odds every five minutes. So you can see changes in all the action. Find out where the public is betting based on the number of tickets and where the money does not match the public opinion. You can check out not just today's action, but future events as well. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Please do at vsin.com slash splits now to claim your free two-week access to vsin's betting splits. Don't strike out on potential winnings. Visit vsin.com slash splits and start making smarter baseball bets and bets beyond today. It's Gil Alexander. It's Kelly Billen. I have a theory about the, uh, the eclipse and as it relates to humans. Oh, First boy. of all, did you catch solar eclipse fever yesterday? Uh, I mean, you and I were texting about the, uh, oh. the news coverage we were watching. Wow, that was, that was something. Fantastic, wasn't it? People really get religious e yeah. and uh, uh, spiritually yeah. when it comes to this. Now, here's the thing with the eclipse. This is just a sort of intergalactic accident that we are... The, the moon is like f one four hundred. Like the, the, the sun is 400 times the size of the moon, but we're at the perfect distance where it covers it perfectly on these rare circumstances. So it's just an accident, right? Like it doesn't happen on other planets necessarily, right? But we are the perfect distance. So this intergalactic, I don't even know if that's the right word, accent, uh, excuse me, accident, you're not using totality enough. Oh, yeah. We got to use totality a million <laughs> times on the show today. They used the word totality yesterday. I was like, okay, we get up with the totality. Yeah, I've heard that word but, more yesterday than I did my entire life. So two things. Like, we're in Vegas. Nothing happened, and yet people say something happened. So this happened to me when I was a kid in D.C. too. I am convinced that people are lying about what they're seeing, not in the, not in the totality spots. Right. But in the non-totality spots, I'm like, you didn't see anything. All I noticed, Gil, was a very sunny day in Vegas yesterday. That's what That's I noticed. That's really so. all I noticed. The other one is they had on CNN, they had this uh, this woman who's a reporter. Her dad is, was an astronaut. And he was, like, howling at it the yeah. whole time. And he said he's waited 78 years to see a uh, full total uh, eclipse. And 
he was like, there was weather in one spot before, and he couldn't get to the other spot before. He's always trying to get to the spot. And I was just like, this man waited 78 years. Like, it's meant so much to him. I found that one really interesting because that was, again, a, a astronaut. Yes. So, like, I'm led to believe he's been in space. Like, that seems like that would be a lot cooler than, than seeing a right. eclipse he from said, the ground. He said no. He said this would be cooler. Yeah. Uh, it was. Uh, the first thing that popped in my head was, like, this is like a guy waiting 78 years to see the Direct TV logo hit the corner. <laughs> exactly. It's like, like what I could come up with. Drew Dinsick seems like an eclipse kind of guy. Uh, at whale <laughs> underscore capper. How you doing, man? You love the eclipse? I'm great, man. You are? Uh, I was I got a little caught up in the coverage yesterday. I liked your guys' breakdown better though; that was funnier. Um, and yeah, I mean, all kinds of interesting stuff going on right now. Earthquakes in New York City and uh, uh, earthquakes in Taiwan. Uh, eclipses that uh, happen once every you know thirty years. Uh, once in a, you know, this is this is pretty cool stuff. And oh. um, I don't know. I I didn't even think to make an effort to try to go see it. Uh, yeah. Now I feel in hindsight like maybe this was worth seeing. What what was our what was my science follow up question from last week for Drew the uh, the quarry the quarry oh yeah for your 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 hard true where where, where are the where's the quarry at uh, Drew where they where they come up with that court surface you don't believe uh, me which which okay, I wanted are, to find the quarry it's in Charlottesville Virginia yeah, Why I don't still you can't find me? the individual quarry though I need the name the hard true quartz that were in Charleston last week it comes from a quarry oh, yeah. in Virginia and Kelly doesn't believe me oh. apparently. It comes from this quarry. Oh, okay. Anyway, okay. it's all throughout the southeast. Yeah. By the way, I, I feel <laughs> no, like I, I yeah, never, I feel never like, looked into that. Uh, I feel Drew comes to us by the way, courtesy of the Progressive Guest Line. I feel like I should ask you about the New York earthquake. Can we do twenty seconds on this? Like, is that yeah, sure. Is that worrisome? By the way, Drew, uh, can we say this out loud on air? Are we allowed to say this on air? Of course. Drew, yeah, Drew is sure. Drew is a seismologist. I'm not just asking some schmendrick here. Uh, does the New York does an earthquake in in on that part of the country alarm you in any way? Uh, no, okay. no, no, there's, there's no, um, uh, the, you know, there, there are random, uh, one-off, um, you know, s smallish earthquakes like this in, uh, stable tectonic regimes all the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is probably like a once in 30 ish year thing, uh, maybe a little longer. I'm sure there's been close to magnitude fives in, in the, uh, uh, you know, New Jersey area, Pennsylvania area before, um, and there will be again, but uh, they're of no consequence to any type of critical infrastructure or tall buildings. They're just novelties. Okay. Stable tectonic regimes, Kelly. That cash is for anybody who had that phrase. Yeah. On the show. yeah. We there's, talk about those way too there's much. There's uh, <laughs> if you didn't know, there's uh, <laughs> there's clearly three very uh, uh, you know uh, well-defined tectonic regimes guild. The stable tectonic, uh, you know, like uh, like in the eastern United States, then Shoot. you have your uh, your active crustal, like we have in California, where you have you know you have your plate margin, uh, and you know we're we're obviously translational with all the strike slip faults, and then uh, of course the subduction regime regimes where you have you know a subducting oceanic plate underneath the continental plate, like in the Pacific Northwest. That was the most unbelievable Boom. paragraph ever uttered on this show. <laughs> that was incredible. I have no idea what he just said. But, un yes. I like the, the uncrustable one. Uncrust yeah, whatever the <laughs> uncrustable. I don't think he said that. I think it's a misquote. Uh, all right. Um, Monte Carlo. So let's do, let's do a couple minutes on tennis, a couple minutes on basketball here. Tennis, we just found out, you and I together and Kelly, Literally before this show, Carlos Alcaraz just pulled out of Monte Carlo. Heavily bandaged forearm, couldn't go. He's going to try to play in the clay tournaments right after this. He still is still a go for what comes here. But, like, first of all, what does it mean for Monte Carlo? Uh, and then what does it mean for the French Open, in your opinion? Uh, Monte Carlo, it means that uh, that Yannick Sinner has got to be a meaningful favorite. I know that uh, the one seed Djokovic is playing well right now, uh, but he is uh, still white well out of form and tough to see that he's going to be uh, sharp enough to get to a final against Sinner, let alone beat him. So uh, Yannick Sinner would be the obvious look uh, at the moment. Um, he's the best clay player and the best overall player. Uh, he's the best overall tennis player on earth right now, and he's the best clay player in this field. With Alcaraz out, um, you know, you, you, you know, in prepping for this, you're like, yeah, you excited for Mike Carlo? Like, yeah, all eyes on Alcaraz. We got to see if this injury is real. Right, uh, it's oh, real. It's he, real. He just pulled out. That's uh, right. Oh, uh oh. Uh, and then, yeah, similarly, we want to see Djokovic. We want to see what kind of form he's in. Uh, my expectation for Djokovic is he likes to kind of ramp up and try to peek around Rome and then take that form into uh, into Roland Garros. So if he if he 
plays well and then has like a shocker of an upset, you know, in, in the second or third uh, match here, I, I won't be I won't be surprised. Uh, Monte Carlo is a little bit of a warm up for Clay. Uh, it even though it has like tons of money and tons of points, and you would think that this has some sort of grand consequences in the scheme of things. It's just a chance for players to kind of get their legs under them on clay uh, before we get to um, you know Madrid and Rome and Roland Garros. Obviously, the biggest prize on clay. Um, and yeah, the fact that we don't have a healthy Nadal here stinks. The fact that we don't have a healthy Alcaraz here stinks. Uh, and I'm starting to get nervous that we're not going to get that matchup uh, at all. Uh, and we yeah. may not see Alcaraz at his peak of his powers trying to take the crown from Nadal at uh, at the Roland Garros uh, this year, which is going to be interesting because. Um, you know, all, if all of a sudden the world is tilting in the favor of Sinner and he continues to improve, uh, you know, on the trajectory we've seen from post U.S. Open last year to today, then, um, you know, we could be uh, in a very interesting place come Wimbledon with, uh, you know, both majors in Sinner's back pocket. Any tennis bets today? Uh, I didn't play anything because I'm again kind of getting my feet under me on okay. clay. Right. Uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of interesting uh, observations from this tournament, surely, um, but. Uh, I think for, you know, for, for sure to this point, uh, things are, are holding to form. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to see what Arthur Fies uh, looks like against Musetti. I think that game should be, I mean, that match should be closer to a pick on right now. Fies is in the plus 163 range, which uh, is intriguing. If I was going to have a bet on tennis today, that would be the only one. I have uh, two dogs, one already lost on uh, Facundo Diaz Acosta against Roberto Bautista Acut, but I'm up a break in the Echeverry plus 140 over Nicolas Yari, so hopefully it can uh, s s eke out a win here. Any NBA plays? Uh, I need uh, I need some uh, some good karma here to get the Thunder uh, a win against Sacramento. I don't care if it's by five points or more. Just beat the Kings, please. Uh, and then similarly, uh, could really use a Phoenix win over the Clippers. I'm uh, sweating out some big bets right now uh, in a number of markets. The uh, the most substantial are miss the playoff markets where I've taken big big swings on the Pelicans at six to one to miss the playoffs. Um, I kind of back that up by playing Pelicans to be in the play in at plus 125 as well. Uh, and so I would, you know, I'd, I don't think that's realistic to expect them to lose to Portland today, but I basically need all of the other uh, teams that are kind of trying to get out of that play in to, uh, to find wins, including Phoenix. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I also have completely capitulated. I just assuming Denver is going to get the one seed and that uh, um, it's a, it's a walk in here for uh, Jokic MVP. Uh, and I play, uh, Denver to win the Northwest um, as aggressively as I could come up with uh, uh, a way to get way into that market. And so I uh, just need the Nuggets to uh, kind of take care of business today and then beat the uh, Timberwolves and, and take the one. Okay. Uh, next week, we'll talk a bunch of NFL draft. Drew, have you started betting anything? Yeah. Finally starting to see some uh, um, just kind of some random props uh, offshore, which is fun. Uh, mostly positional markets. Um, I need uh, I need a couple of I need some defensive players at this point. Over. Uh, we'll just put it that way. Okay, we'll get into detail on that next week. He needs some <laughs> defensive players on a draft that is uh, first round that is heavily projected as offensive. Drew, appreciate it. Appreciate all the bets, man. Good luck with all of them. Absolutely. Best luck today, guys. Drew Dinsick at Whale underscore Capper. Deep Dive and Bet the Edge podcast. We'll come back a little baseball with Mark Borchard on the other side next. A numbers game on v the sports betting network. An action-packed fight card is taking over Las Vegas for UFC 300. And DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any UFC 300 bet. Download the app and use promo code v when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is your skill, Alexander. It is Kelly Bidlin. Uh, we have so many tweets to get to. We have so many tech. But let me just do text real quick. Lou Finicaro, by the way, says, uh, Schmendrick, LOL. Have not heard that in decades. You are welcome, <laughs> sir. I'm glad someone noticed. Uh, this is from, uh, I, I will read a couple tweets. This is from uh, Brad Billups. Is there a Masters prop live winner versus PGA Tour winner? Ooh. Um, no, but that'd be a good one. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah. There's like top live finisher, like, all that stuff. We have about a thousand people trying to answer the question of is is UConn the best 
the best team since 2000. We'll get to those later. The New Jersey, New York ex, uh, ex says, wait, I'm sorry. You're telling me that Danny Hurley, a man who has gotten into a fight with at least three three uh, separate fan bases in the last month and a half is not a normal coach in his, in his demeanor? A bit of a spaz, that's what I'm saying. Jeff Levine, watching UConn's performance, uh, performances touches other buttons. Their movement, obviously, coaching is as much art as it is sport. It is beautiful to see them apply such a selfless approach, approach in such a smooth fashion. Nary a superstar among them. Just awesome. It's a great tweet. Jesse Welch. All right, guys, national championship's over. ANG's first segment is over. Now let's get back to why the hell can't Wemby win defensive player of the year. <laughs> it's funny you say that. Michael Montesano tweeting this morning. Also, this latest uh, tweet from BKB. Wembanyama minutes played per game this year. Um, you know, is less than 30. The average all-star minutes played per game is 35.1. If you projected his numbers over 35.1 minutes, he'd be averaging 29.6 points a game, 14.2 boards, 5.6 assists, 4.4 blocks, 52% field goal percentage, 33.3% behind the arc, and 83.1% free throw percentage. Uh, that is a MVP season is what that is yeah forget defensive player of the year for that particular uh for that particular argument right there live um, player to win plus 20 225 at DraftKings. no minus 330 plus 225 yes on a live player minus 330 no thank yep. you kelly at DraftKings. Uh, and then to the answer by the way uh was Doug montesano put in the you know the question i, I arbitrarily said the year 2000 so you got the best team since 2000 he said 1999 duke had the bet had the highest adjusted efficiency margin per Ken Palm. That's just offensive efficiency minus defensive efficiency at plus 43. I did say 2000 though arbitrarily. And they, by the way, they lost to UConn in 99. Uh, but he did say 2015 Kentucky, which was the comp that we gave out earlier, plus 36.9 adjusted offensive uh, adjusted efficiency margin. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk some baseball. Mark Borchard from an undisclosed location somewhere in the desert at Base Winner. Basewinner.com. All things Base Winner. He also does the uh, Bet US show every day. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. I'm really excited about this race to 10. Uh, and it looks like Pittsburgh is really the the front runner right now. Yeah, so and we it's such were, a cool bet. So yeah. we were talking, and Kelly and I were talking about this before the show. So case okay, so, so right now, can we throw up the graphic? So I, I have a bet for best record, best not best record, let me let me restate that. Most wins in March and April. And I have the Cleveland Guardians at 65 to 1. Right now, the Pirates are 9 and 2, the Yankees are 9 and 2, the Dodgers are 9 and 4. Remember they played extra games. The Guardians who lost a game courtesy of in 2 and then the Red Sox are 7 and 3. Those are those are the teams at the top. What you're talking about is the race to 10, which was widely available. DraftKings had it. And the Pirates have the of the 9 win teams, Pirates, Yankees, Dodgers, they've got the early game today. So we were trying to figure out if anybody has a Buckos first to 10 number out there that they got pre-flop. We were trying to figure it out because we can't find it, but we know it's longer than 20 to 1. That's as much as we Doesn't know. It seem like that would be something that, that uh, Jason would have. I mean, it just does. He, he, I thought he loved the Pirates, so maybe he's got it. Maybe. The Pirate, remember, the, didn't the Pirates have a great start last year too, Mark? I, I, I don't know. I, they I, did. I, they did. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. They were like the first to 20 last year. The Pirates were. And then it just became, you know, a typical bucko season after that. But this is two years in a row where they had a great start. So congrats. If they get it done this morning, and that's a big if, of course, because then the Yankees and the Dodgers are up next this afternoon. But if they get it done for anybody who has that bet, good on you for the Pirates first to 10. Did you dabble in any of these markets? I did. I, I bet the Dodgers, I split a unit. I bet the Dodgers a half unit. At, I think they were 250 plus 250. And then I bet the Braves at 12 to 1. And it, it looks like I'm going to have to have some racing luck to get that Dodgers in, but possibly. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting against the Yankees, obviously. And but I don't have that as a play. But uh, I mean, it's exciting because it's like, okay, first of all, which game's going to finish first, right? It, and, and and the Dodger yeah. game starts behind the Yankee game, so maybe you're praying for rain a little bit in that Yankee game, you know? And, well, and, this yeah, is... Their game starts before it. Yeah, this didn't come into play, but it could have. I, I cashed a 15-1 to 1 on the Panthers to have... Uh, to be the last team to win a game in the NFL. And had it been all things equal, which it wasn't in the end, I won it fair and square, but had it been all things equal... It's the first, it doesn't matter if it's the same day, it's the first team to get there that day, you know? Like if, if yeah. yeah, so it's, um, you know, um, 
that obviously would be reversed in the case of the last team to win. But in this case, it's it's more intuitive. Uh, okay, and, and let me just say this again: that bet that I have March April on the Guardians, and I would say this for anybody who has a bet like this, I am more obsessed with that bet than I am with anything else I'm doing. Every day I'm a massive Guardians fan. I'm locked into their games. I know their schedule. Like We just posted it up here. I know how many games each team has left, right? I know, um, you know where the weather, like I was so locked into the weather in Minneapolis on Sunday, because I'm like, oh, this is not gonna happen. Like sweating weather because of this stuff. And then you're also, of course, a fan of the teams that are playing, the teams you're competing with, so. These are awesome bets. That's great bet. That's a, that's almost even a bet. It's more of a sane bet, your bet, because you get a little bit bigger sample. Yeah. But how cool, like, like, I mean, this wasn't going on, you know, 25 years ago when we started. No, like maybe 20 years ago when we started, you know. So, <laughs> this, the, this, forget it. Remember, we when we were doing it, they didn't have five inning bets. Like, we forget about that. Nobody had five inning bets when we started doing this, you know. Uh, we act like we're a 1,000 years old, but it feels that way. What did you bet today, it, it, Mark? It does. You know, speaking of that Yankees team, I bet against him today. A.J. Puck, I still have hopes for this guy. You know, one of the things he's got is a really high strikeout percentage over his last 150 plate appearances. It's 31.3%. I took Miami at full game plus 177. You know, the, the Yankees are – talk about an interesting team, Gil. If you look at the Yankees, XFIP minus to date – uh, they are 26th in the league, and they're sitting at 9-2 and two in the standings. I don't know if that's even theoretically possible. Obviously, it <laughs> happened, but, like, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's kind of kind of like the, talk about an outlier. And uh, so I, I, I'm looking to, to, to fade the Yankees. I think that they're kind of overpriced in the market. And then I'm going to go with, with the favorite of the show, Gil. I know everybody loves the base winner parlay. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I just, I'm just not going to overthink it. I, I like Ronaldo Lopez and the Braves. Uh, Lopez looking, talk about 30% strikeout rate. He's at 31%. And then Savale uh, for the Rays. This is so surprising. Every time I look at it, I, I think, gosh, there's, there's an accounting error, but there's not. 32% strikeout rate over his last 150. I, I've got value on both games. I'm going to go ahead and risk one to win 1.81 units on that parlay, Gil. All right, repeat the parlay again. It is? It is the Braves full game, Tampa Bay full game. A risk one to, win, to win, oh. 1 to win, 1.81. Okay. Not <clears throat> not an official segment until base winner gives his parlay of the day. Uh, but you are taking the Marlins straight. I, I caught that correctly. I am. You know, it's it's you know, one of the things that I do on my site, and I want to pump my site up a little bit because I think this is cool, uh, is the expected standings part uh, where I can go ahead and look and see, well, what is this team supposed to be? Love that. And 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 the Yankees are, are are good. I mean, they're they're definitely hitting good. 121 weighted runs created plus to date, uh, but they're nine and two. They should be six six point one and four point nine. So I think that the, I I, I want to uh, play if, if the if the daily card shows value playing against these teams then it makes sense to me. And I just think the Yankees are, are really overrated right now uh, in, in the market, Gil. Got 30 seconds. I want your answer to this question because I asked this of Spore yesterday. Obviously, late, latest pitcher now that looks, you know, got the old sore elbow is Framber Valdez of the Astros, right? This on the heels of other huge names like Shane Bieber and obviously uh, Spencer Strider. It's just every day it seems like it's some other big name. <laughs> Do, does this make you not want to bet Cy Young props until much later in the season? Oh, that's a really good point, Gil. I never really thought about it from that perspective, but yes. Uh, you know, when you're sitting on two games of Shane Bieber, it's just really elite levels. He had the best base winner ERA in baseball, and you're just excited about it because I had him to win the Cy Young. Uh, and and now he's he's done. So now now you're out. And yeah, so maybe that that's a really good point. Something that I never even think thought about, Gil. But yeah, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. It's just so depressing, man. It really is. Uh, Mark Borchard, everybody. Thank you so much at Base Winner, courtesy of the Progressive Guest Line. Thank you, Mark. Peace, Gil. My man, best in the business. John Hasselbauer on the Masters next numbers game. Visa the Sports Betting Network.